Good morning. It's nine o'clock in the morning on the second day of December 2020, and we welcome you to this virtual Grand Rounds. This Grand Rounds is actually a professorial chair uh, to be delivered by um, none other than the division chief of the Division of Rheumatology here in UPPGH. Before we start off, I'd like to welcome Dr. John Anunuevo to give us the welcome remarks. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you, Hazel. So um, today we gather again as we continuously search for uh, more knowledge and new ideas that can help us make differences in the lives of our patients. There are actually only a few in our faculty who are given a chance to deliver uh, professorial lectures. And um, this is status is actually given to members of the faculty who have made significant impact in the respective subspecialty. But more importantly, I think someone who has the important qualities of a five-star doctor, as we say, you know, a person who is a care provider, a decision maker, a communicator, a community leader, and a manager. And those qualities are all packaged in our Diamond Jubilee professorial lecturer today. She will talk about something that uh, might have affected one of us already and definitely may affect one of us in the near future. And that is the topic on young onset gout, its diagnosis and outcomes. Gout is considered a chronic disease, a rather com complex inflammatory disorder that usually lasts your whole life. And for some of our patients to have it very early, that is really life-changing. So today, let us welcome someone who I really think represents the Department of Medicine at its very best and learn more about the topic of young onset gout. She will be formally introduced by our moderator, Dr. Hazel Breyers. And I would like to thank everyone again for attending the lecture today and special welcome to our medical students. Again, good morning sa inyong lahat. Thank you, Dr. Anunuevo, for that very apt introduction. We'd like to welcome this morning as well, Dr. Roddy C., Professor Emeritus and former chair of the Department of Medicine. Thank you for joining us. And also in the audience is the first graduate of the Rheumatology Training Program in PGH, Dr. Rosario Nadora. Thank you for joining us as well, Dr. Nadora. Um, we have a lot of medical students here. And we, when we hear about gout, the typical picture that's given to us, as Dr. Anunuevo said, would be a middle-aged man who's probably a businessman, no pang mayaman yung gout, who go goes into a drinking binge and then develops joint pain. So it's really very stereotypical in the same way that all patients who develop MI are 45-year-old businessmen who are type A personalities. But increasingly in the practice of rheumatology, we do see that there is there seems to be a pattern that is not quite as the textbook would always tell us. And I can't think of a more, as Dr. Uh, Anyanuevo said, a more, the more, the how do you say, the most qualified physician to talk about this than somebody whom I know to be a very astute clinician who really applies her learnings in epidemiology in discerning patterns among her patients. So to formally introduce our speaker, this is the Diamond Jubilee Professorial Chair Awardee for 2020 from the Division of Rheumatology, Dr. Evelyn Salido. Dr. Salido was a graduate of UPCM, the super class 87, and she actually graduated in the top 10 of her class, which just goes to show how smart she is. No? She earned her master's in clinical epidemiology, did her residency and fellowship training in IM and in internal medicine and rheumatology, also from PGH. So she's completely UP grown. Okay? 
Uh, she presently sits as a professor too for the Division of Rheumatology and I'm very proud to say is our um, division chair as well. Dr. Salido also served as the past president of PRA and has been one of the driving forces in the special in interest group for gout, um, special interest group also for PRA. So to deliver her talk for this uh, morning, which is Young Onset Gout um, Epidemiology and Outcomes, we'd like to welcome Dr. Salido. Good morning. Uh, Hazel, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And Dr. Año Nuevo, thank you very much for nominating me for this, uh, for this professorial chair. Uh, thank you. I cannot say more than thank you. So let me just share with uh, the students and the rest of the audience a review about current issues about gout, describe the characteristics of young onset gout, uh, my observations on a small cohort of patients in my practice who have young onset gout, as well as summarize its clinical implications. So what are the issues about gout that beset us now? It's the most common inflammatory arthritis in Filipinos. And although these data are quite old, we see here from the National Nutrition which was done in 2003, that in the community, more than 4,000 adults who are more than 20 years old, the prevalence of gout is 1.6%. But if you say that's old data, uh, newer studies done in various countries looking at these, these are large populations that they've studied and these are more recent years, we saw that the prevalence and the incidence of gout has doubled or at least has gone higher in most of these places. If we look at the data for Hong Kong, this is 1.5%, uh, which is close to our 1.6% prevalence. And it has doubled uh, from 2006 to 2016. So this is not, this increasing disease burden of gout is not only true in these places, but is true all over the world as shown in this study. But you might think uh, if you look at the uh, global burden of gout, you will see, oh, it's not as big a burden as maybe COVID now or tuberculosis or diabetes or hypertension. But in fact, you will see uh, now that we are beset by the problem of COVID in PGH, we see, we still see a lot of patients who have COVID who are in fact referred for the problem of gout. We have seen patients who have tuberculosis and we have difficulty in controlling their tuberculosis because of the recurrence of their gouty arthritis. And uh, we also have patients with diabetes and hypertension, with chronic kidney disease, and we see gout as a co-factor uh, in their clinical deterioration. So it is something that we must know and we must study. It is, uh, as, aside from the conditions I've mentioned, uh, gout is seen to be 70% higher among, uh, or, or rather those with gout um, have a hazard ratio of 1.78% for incident chronic kidney disease of stage three. So people with gout have a 70% higher risk of developing CKD of stage three or higher. There is also a doubling of mortality so if uh, CKD does not catch our attention, maybe the risk of dying should. And we see that among women, the mortality ratio is even, uh, is very high. Okay, 
The third issue with gout is that treatment is not optimized. Often, we see a patient with arthritis and we give them anti-inflammatory treatment and forget about what should happen next. When the patient is relieved of the pain, sometimes the patient and even the doctor forgets that there is a second phase in the treatment of gout, which is urate lowering. And if we are uh, not successful in doing this, then our patient can get into trouble. The gout will not be controlled. And when we talk of urate lowering, we do not only lower the uric acid to what is normal, which is uh, seven milligrams percent among males and six milligram percent among females. But there is a certain target to which we should go down to, which is usually six milligrams per deciliter for any person with gout if they do not have TOFI, but the target serum uric acid is even lower. It's less than five milligrams per deciliter for those who have TOFI. So uh, these are again the population studies that I have referred to earlier. They have seen that the use or the prescription of urate lowering therapy is quite low. You see here, only 33% or 25% and adherence among patients is also low. Although in the UK in 2015, in this publication, they have shown increasing adherence from 28 to 39%. So they must be doing something right. But here in our OPD, we did a small study in 2015 among 138 outpatients and although all of them were prescribed urate lowering therapy, the target serum uric acid was only achieved in 37% when we looked at them at six months or at 12 months of treatment. So this is a problem which we, we have to do something about. And um, this failure to achieve the target serum uric acid uh, with urate lowering therapy, for example, allopurinol has largely been attributed to non-adherence uh, of patients. And we think that we can improve this if we study the reasons why they are not adherent and we engage with them and educate them of the importance of taking or continuing their urate lowering therapy. However, that is not the only problem here, no? or that is not only the reason found in this study published in 2014. The other two reasons were underdosing as well as partial resistance to the urate lowering drug. And these are under uh, the decision or the control of the physicians. So, we, we sometimes forget to titrate our dose. No, sometimes allopurinol is fixed at 300 milligrams per day. And sometimes we fail you to recognize that the patient may in fact be resistant to the urate lowering treatment that we are giving and that we need to change to another kind of medicine. So the problem or, well, the issue of medication adherence often is uh, thought or brought back to the issue of cost. That's true. Cost is always an issue when you are dealing with a disease which needs long-term treatment. So pointed out that the physician and the patient are also equal determinants in um, medication adherence. So for the physicians, that's uh, our part. I have already mentioned that there is a low rate of prescription of urate lowering therapy. But another issue that they found in this study was that there was also low rate of prophylaxis using colchicine or anti-inflammatory drug when we initiate our urate lowering therapy. 
I don't know if you are familiar with the concept of mobilization flare, which is aggravation or occurrence of attacks of gout when we initiate our urate lowering therapy. And we can prevent that by giving our patient prophylactic colchicine doses for a few months, usually uh, six months or more until we are able to lower our serum uric acid level. Okay, and the third uh, factor in medication adherence, of course, is the patient. And this study has shown that patients who are in pain or who are taking their medications already routinely, you know, these are those already with maintenance medications. These are those who seem to have better medication adherence. And those patients who were younger had fewer diseases or fewer comorbids, certain ethnic groups, and those people who have a lot of concerns about taking their medicines, they are those who have poor medication adherence. So let me emphasize here, those who have younger age. Okay, one concept that is very important for us to remember is that gout is a progressive disease. Uh, what we see in our clinic when the patient comes to us will be just the surface, no? These are the acute intermittent gout flares. But if you look below here, uh, you actually hear, see here the stages of gout, which are asymptomatic hyperuricemia, which is a very long period of persistent hyperuricemia during which the patient is asymptomatic. And in medical school, we are taught that only 10% of these patients with, of these people with asymptomatic hyperuricemia will eventually develop gout and develop the arthritis and the periods of asymptomatic intercritical periods between these attacks. And if this uh, hyperuricemia is uncontrolled, then the patient eventually develops advanced gout. So we know this. We know these stages of gout. But we forget that throughout all this period, we have the process of crystal deposition occurring. And you know, these crystals are foreign body. There's a foreign body. And what happens when you have a foreign body? There will be inflammation that will uh, attach itself to that deposition. So in fact, even if we see our patients with, uh, with gout who may be walking around without pain, Studies have shown that there is low-grade inflammation in the areas where they have crystal deposit. And another thing is that we may see this, but we don't see the accumulating urate pool, increasing body urate pool. So these are two important concepts that we must remember about gout. It's not only the arthritis, but it is the total body urate pool, the accumulation of deposits in our whole body. So ultrasound has shown that um, the deposits can be visualized and in the articular cartilage. So we see the double contour sign and even dual energy CT has shown that among patients who do not have visible TOFI, they may in fact have these uh, deposits of TOFI, which we don't see, but are there around the joints. So Dr. Dalbeth, who is a prominent rheumatologist in New Zealand, who has a lot of studies and understanding of gout, in fact, has proposed that we think of gout as a symptomatic disease and symptomatic disease, and that some patients, in fact, already have the MSU crystal deposition without the signs or symptoms of gout. 
And that, that will be critical in thinking always that we, we do not forget that hyperuricemia is not the only issue, but it is the total body urate burden and that there is ongoing deposition and deposition of the crystals is a factor of time and serum uric acid level. These studies in the US, this is a large study, so they looked at four cohort studies of more than 18,000 patients who were in the community and did not have gout. And they were observed for a period of 15 years. So these were healthy young people. And what did they found? They looked at the risk of gout over 15 years and they saw that is based on the initial serum uric acid level. So if you go back to time zero and you look at the people who had a serum uric acid of 10 and you look at the graph, you will see that at risk of developing gout is 50%. Those who had a serum uric acid of 7 to 7.9, so these are blue line that at 15 years, their risk of developing gout is 10%. So you see how much the uric acid years ago matters in your developing, in someone's development of gout. So this figure again, so you, you will probably now understand that because we have to dissolve the deposits which have been accumulating over a long period of time, then lifelong uric acid lowering therapy is important. And that is, it is important to look at our young onset gout population because they are those who have uh, earlier onset of of the urate crystal deposition and has and have had more time to accumulate it. So let's look at uh, this subgroup of patients with gout. So uh, this is arbitrarily defined to be a population of gout whose onset is at 30 years or below. But uh, there were also studies I've, sh I've seen wherein they had a cutoff of 20 and they called those juvenile gout or cutoff of 40 because we know that classical gout, the onset is at points of age. So is the young onset gout group different from classic gout in terms of diagnosis, treatment, their causes and prognosis? And to answer the question, I looked at the lit literature and look at, a, uh, at my medical records and uh, I will share the results with you today. So in my literature search, I found this article by Dr. Burke uh, about gout, a report of an unusual case in a young man. And this was published in 1948. And I quote, he said, recently I attended a case of gout in which the bone and joint destruction were so far advanced that no parallel could be found in the literature examined. There were other aspects which were unusual enough to warrant a presentation of the case. And I, I was uh, amazed at this report because this was in fact a 28 year old Filipino from San Fernando Luzon who was working in a sugar plantation admitted in March 1946 in Honolulu due to arthritis in his finger joints. And his gout attack started at 10 years old. And at 20 years of age, he had an operation of the right big toe to address pain and deformity. And that was really a tophus that they operated on. And unfortunately, the patient did not know what it was. And when Dr. Burke saw him in 1946, he was amazed at the amount of destruction that the x-rays of this patient showed. So how many of our gout population in fact have 
young onset gout. So these are the same, uh, well, these are other studies. These are not the same as those I quoted earlier. Uh, these are smaller studies and uh, these were done in Taiwan wherein they have a large population of gout. Uh, India, Philippines, and China. And let's first look at these first four studies. You will see that most of the patients they had came from hospitals or rheumatology clinics. And uh, these are relatively small populations, 100 patients, 200. Uh, our study in 2015, we had 669 patients with gout. And in Taiwan, the first one, they had more than a thousand patients over a seven year period. So in these four, four studies, the cutoff for young onset gout was 30 years of age. And the prevalence is from 15 to 25%. But in this large study in Taiwan, we're in, they had the large gout database of 28,000 patients uh, with data collected over many, many years, uh, they had a cutoff of 20 years old. And uh, young onset gout or juvenile gout was 1.9%. But quite striking is the family history. You see that 40, 44%, 47% in our study in the Philippines had a family history of gout. So that is something to take note of. Now, uh, if you remember earlier, I mentioned that uh, only 10% of those who develop hyperuricemia will in fact develop gout. But what causes hyperuricemia in the first place? Uh, a long time ago, people have been uh, preoccupied with uh, dietary purines as causing um, uh, hyperuricemia of gout. But from this diagram, you will see that overproduction is only a problem in 10% of patients with gout. And um, this is where you have the effect of di dietary purines. And on the right side of the diagram, you see that the larger or the more frequent cause of hyperuricemia in gout is in fact under excretion. And if you think about it, then uh, this is a tubular, renal tubular abnormality, uh, wherein you may have a decrease in urinary excretion or an increase in urinary reabsorption of the urate uh, molecule. Okay, so uh, studies, recent studies have shown that aside from drugs, aside from diseases, and the diet, genetic polymorphisms really play a large role in causing hyperuricemia. And uh, even the development of gout from hyperuricemia seems to be determined to a large extent also by genetic polymorphisms. Although we must admit that lifestyle because the level of hyperuricemia and the rate of increase of the serum uric acid may in fact also play a role in the conversion of hyperuricemia to gout. So um, we think of two problems, lifestyle and genetic polymorphisms. So let me just share with you that uh, genome studies have already determined a lot of genes which are associated with with hyperuricemia. So they found this out among, through studies of patients with gout who, and compared with uh, controls. So you see here a lot of genes already identified, but we, we also see here at the bottom genes associated with development of gout from hyperuricemia. And the, uh, as of this publication in 2016, they have identified three genes which have been associated with uh, development of gout from hyperuricemia. And uh, last year, uh, there was this article on familial early onset hyperuricemia and gout associated with a newly identified dysfunctional variant 
in the urate transporter ABCG2. So this is uh, quite exciting because this is early onset hyperuricemia associated with early onset gout. And uh, they, you look at the red arrow here that they have identified a dysfunctional variant in this urate transporter. And because of the abnormality in this urate transporter, there is a reduction in the urinary excretion of urates. Now this is at the right is another publication. This is very new, this is 2020. And this is a study of the genetics of gout in New Zealand among a hundred, uh, this is uh, more than a thousand patients, including a young onset gout, which they defined as onset before 40 years. And they confirmed the association with an allele, with a particular allele of the ABCG2 gene. So this is very exciting. We hope that Next year, the Philippines can already start with its genetic study uh, of gout uh, through, through a study headed by Dr. Michael T. Okay, so let us now look at how young onset gout presents. Uh, please bear with me. This is a very busy slide. Uh, we're in... We, I looked at three groups of studies and they had three different cutoffs for definition of young onset gout. So at the upper one third, you have those which are, uh, were in the cutoff is 20 years in the middle of the table, 30 years and at the lower part, 40 years old. And let's first look at the upper one third. Okay, what do we see here? Juvenile gout, high family history and high BMI. And they found that they have very high serum uric acid levels, they have lower uh, GFR, they have abnormal lipid profiles, and they have impaired liver or renal function. What about in the middle of the ball? Uh, these are those with a cutoff at 30 years old. They found polyarticular a uh, higher uh, presentation of gout as polyarticular, earlier TOFI, usually within the first two years. And instead of gout more occurring at the big toe, they found that it was more common in the knee. So this was the study in India. But in the, um, if you look at the other studies, they also found higher family history and higher BMI, as well as higher uric, uric acid uh, levels. And um, when they looked at um, those, well, these are those who are 31 to 40 years of age included. Uh, so these are gout patients uh, up to 40 years of age they had hypertension or hyperlipidemia as well. And they are less likely to achieve a serum uric acid of less than six with treatment. Now at the bottom of the, of the table, the cutoff was 40 years old. So these were, these were studies in France and in China. And they also found more polyarticular flares as well as involvement of the ankle or the midfoot as more prominent rather than the classic podagra. And most notable here also is the high occurrence of the metabolic syndrome. So if I will summarize the seven observational studies which were done in various countries from, and published from 2005 to 2019, these are the six points there is higher occurrence of a positive family history for gout, higher BMI, earlier occurrence of TOFI, higher occurrence of polyarticular arthritis, less involvement of the big toe, and higher serum uric acid levels. Now, what about in the Philippines? I mentioned that we had a study in 2015, and this was on 669 patients with gout and 101 of them were young in onset uh, before 30, 
at 30 or below. And uh, looking at this small population, the mean age was 25. They were all males. 47% of them had a family history. And you see that there was a long delay in diagnosis. The, the mean delay was 12 years. Uh, some of, uh, I had a few patients, their diagnosis was previously a sprain, uh, probably because the ankle was the most commonly involved joint. Uh, there were others who were diagnosed to have rheumatic fever and were in fact being given uh, penador prophylaxis. And if you will look at the time to TOFI in years, 2.8 uh, years to de develop TOFI, which is quite fast, and 37% uh, of they had the GFR less than 60. And their mean serum uric acid is quite high at 9.2. Now let me point you to the right side of, the, of this table, which is the review I did on my private patients. Uh, I did it this year during the pandemic uh, on 50 patients who had uh, onset gout and their mean age was 24. They were also all males, but uh, there is a shorter delay in diagnosis, only 4.2 years, but if you ask me, that's still a a long time for a diagnosis to be delayed. Uh, in this population, only a few of them had polyarthritis at onset, but it was still the ankle, which was the most frequent joint involved. And in fact, many of them thought that they just had a sprain after playing basketball. 39% of these patients uh, already had TOFI and uh, there was a longer time to TOFI in terms of seven years. And uh, well, I'm happy that uh, fewer of them had a GFR of less than 60 ml per minute, but uh, you will see that the mean serum uric acid is still very high at 10.5. Uh, in fact, um, uh, you will see later that the mean serum that, uh, I had a patient whose serum uric acid was as high as 0.9. Okay, so um, not only was the family history of gout in these 50 patients, 50%, uh, but the family history of metabolic syndrome was, was high as well. No? This was more than 60%. And uh, most of these patients had good college education and were employed. Uh, in fact, three of them were, were working abroad, so they were only able to consult uh, once to twice a year. And um, there was a high prevalence of alcohol intake, All, although only a few, uh, only 30% had alcohol intake of weekly or more frequently. So I was uh, saying that the mean serum uric acid in this group of 50 patients was quite high, 0.63, and in one patient it was 0.9, which is really more than double what is normal. And 74% uh, of them had acute gouty arthritis when they first came to the clinic, 39% already had TOFI, and 19% already had low GFR when they came. 14% 14 ha 14 had a history of urolithiasis, but um, not all of them had uh, kidney imaging. So I'm not really sure if uh, <clears throat> the prevalence of urolithiasis is this low because a study done by Dr. T showed that um, there was a 47% prevalence of urolithiasis uh, in the patients uh, that he had uh, with gout. Okay, and uh, please put particular attention to this conditions related to hyperuricemia in this group. 76% had high BMI, so that is overweight or obese, and 40% of them had elevated triglycerides, um, and many of them were hypertensives. Uh, there was only one patient who had erythrocytosis and our uh, genetic studies did not show that uh, he had polycythemia vera. And there was one patient who was on a diuretic. And note here that 14% of these patients had fatty liver. Uh, 
and they were just in their 20s. Oh, prior to their first clinic visit, 88% already were taking medicines and 50% were on colchicine or an NSAID and 36% were already previously given uh, urate lowering therapy, either fabusostat or allopurinol, but these were not maintained by the patients. And when I saw them, uh, all of them were put on colchicine uh, some of them were given NSAIDs for their arthritis, some of them needed steroids, and 94% were eventually given urate-lowering therapy. Uh, three were not because uh, one had Stevens-Johnson uh, and two had uh, other forms of hypersensitivity to the ULT, so I had to refer them to an allergologist for, future, for uh, management. So uh, six, more than 60% of the patients were given allopurinol and this ranged from 300 to 600 milligrams. And 36% were given febusostat, ranging from 40 to 120 milligrams on, on subsequent follow-up. And treatment of comorbid conditions, hypertension, uh, high triglycerides, obesity were done. Okay, so my observations over two years were on the occurrence of gouty arthritis. Uh, how good were they in taking their medicines? Uh, were we able to achieve optimal serum uric acid? What happened to the TOFI and to the renal function? And again, this is a busy table, but let's look at it uh, uh, per column. Uh, I divided their two-year period two-year observation period into four. I uh, remember this is a review, so I had a lot of missing data. If you look at period one, which is the first six months, 42 patients had follow-up follow ups during this time, but only 35 patients had a serum uric acid, so I only considered observations for the 35 patients. Uh, they were consulting one to four times, uh, mean of two, and uh, more than 60% did not have gouty arthritis. And uh, optimal serum uric acid was only achieved in 22%, but 80% claimed that they were adhering to their ULT. Uh, they, there was no reduction in TOFI size. Uh, and uh, among 37 patients who had a serum creatinine, 81% uh, of them had uh, GFR more than 60, and uh, only 19% had GFR less than 60. And if you look at the rest of the periods, well, you will see that uh, there were less patients who were consulting over the next three periods. And uh, But if you look at uh, occurrence of gouty arthritis, you will see that it's more or less 60%, so meaning there were still 40% of them who had attacks of gouty arthritis, which is bad. And if you look at optimal serum uric acid uh, achievement, then not very good, we can do better. And, uh, but you will see that many of them tell me that they are taking their medicine. So I don't know if I should believe that or, uh, are they, do they belong to the ULT resistant group of patients? But very important here is that by period three, which is uh, 13 to 18 months of follow up, there were three patients who said that they noted a reduction in size. And in one patient, there was almost disappearance of the TOFI. So that made them very happy. And uh, I must mention that. TOFI was really a big, the occurrence of TOFI was really a big issue for, for some of the patients because in fact, in two of the patients in one, one already had an amputation of a digit and in one, uh, and two others already had surgery for TOFI because of difficulty in function. So about renal function, if you look at them generally, there were some patients, there were a few, uh, remember I'm talking here of very few of a small population, but there were some who had improvement in their FR, probably because they were able to, they had less attacks of arthritis and they discontinued their NSAIDs. 
Okay, so um, I'm winding down into my summary of these observations. So what are these? Uh, there's significant delay in diagnosis and treatment, probably because uh, uh, who would think that a 20-year-old will have gout? And probably also because um, the joints involved were not classically big, uh, and they had other differentials like a sprain uh, or rheumatic fever. Uh, family history was uh, very high among these patients with young onset gout, which if you think may facilitate diagnosis, but not necessarily the treatment. And uh, we might also uh, think that these are familial disorders we're dealing with or really a genetic polymorphism. Uh, there is a high prevalence of obesity and high triglycerides rides which can serve as additional targets of treatment whether therapeutic or preventive and one very important lesson for me here is that we need to search for disease conditions or medicines that cause hyperuricemia because it may be that there are many disease conditions or, or even medicines that they are taking that in fact can be contributing to their hyperuricemia now, talking of obesity uh, and the earlier age of gout onset, um, this is a longitudinal study, which is called CLU-2. Uh, this is of residents in Washington State. And this is 15,000 patients who were community dwellers. They did not have gout. And this is over a long observation period. And uh, there were 500 of them, 517 who developed gout. And if you look at the, at the red arrows here, when they studied the baseline BMI, those, if you look at those who were not obese compared with those who were obese when they started the study, uh, those who were obese had gout earlier and the difference was three years. But if you look at BMI at age 21 years, those who were not obese and compared to those who were obese and who developed gout, the, the difference was 11 years. So those who had high BMI at age 21 years uh, really developed gout earlier. And that was 11 years earlier. So that is important to remember, okay. So another observation uh, in my small cohort was about renal dysfunction. And oftentimes, uh, was it really a cause or an effect of gout? Something that we need to investigate on. There was also a trend for early formation of TOFI and the potential for disability. I was talking of one patient who already needed an amputation and one who had excision to improve function. And there was marked hyperuricemia. In many of them, the uric acid is more than double the, the upper limit of normal, which speaks of a high urate burden. And uh, in these patients with TOFI, we need lower serum uric acid target to dissolve the TOFI. Therefore, a need for consistent and prolonged intake of urate lowering therapy. The patients had erratic follow-up, which is not unusual for in gout. Therefore, we must make each one of these follow-ups count to counsel and educate. And with regards achievement of optimal it was slow but possible in some patients. And if we are able to convince patients to adhere to their drugs, um, then and they are already taking their medicines and their uric acid is still not optimal, then we must think of other strategies that we can do to achieve target uric acid. These may be people who are actually resistant to our allopurinol or febusostat. And uh, on those who had recurrent gouty arthritis, what I observed is that they were those who really had uncontrolled hyperuricemia. But for those patients who were free of gouty arthritis on follow-up, it did not always mean that they had normal or optimal serum uric acid. So the lesson for us is that among patients who follow up 
who do not have gouty arthritis, we really need to check their ceruric acid level to see if it's good or not. So what are the implications for clinical practice? Uh, one would be the typical arthritis presentation among patients with young onset gout. Number two would be the need for early and thorough investigation. We think of the causes as well as the consequences of the prolonged period of hyperuricemia. There's also the potential for poor prognosis of untreated issue uh, of untreated disease. There is the adherence issue and there is a need for individualized treatment. So how long is long-term? That's a frequent question. And uh, to answer that, one must think of what is causing the hyperuricemia in this patient, what are the contributory factors, what is the duration of gout prior to urate lowering therapy, and have I been able to achieve target serovuric acid? Let's, let me just share with you our three studies on tophaceous gout patients. Uh, these are gout in general, not young onset gout. And uh, this in, these are small groups of patients, uh, 10, 21, and the biggest is 211. And uh, the common theme in, this in these studies is that it's possible to have uh, quiet, no recurrence of arthritis if you are able to continuously control the conditions that cause hyperuricemia, like for example, obesity. And if you are able to, con to maintain a serum uric acid of less than seven during the period when uh, there has been a cessation of uric lowering therapy. And and uh, among these patients, they discontinued urate lowering therapy after many years of, uh, of control of gout. In fact, uh, many years after resolution of the TOFI. Okay, so that is one thing to remember. Now, another common question is how low should we go? Because in fact, there has been no lower limit for serum uric acid that has been established. And population-based lower limit is 3 milligrams per deciliter or 0.18 millimoles per liter. Uh, one one uh, theoretical uh, consequence of very low uric acid is uh, neurologic uh, deterioration, dementia, or cardiovascular consequences. Because remember that uric acid is a, a free radical scavenger. No? Uh, however, patients on peglotikase, which is a pegylated recombinified mammalian uric acid, who maintain very low uric acid over months to years, uh, those who have hereditary santinuria and those with renal hypouricemia types 1 and 2, these are patients who have very low uric acid uh, don't seem to have uh, any uh, consequences. Okay, so um, to summarize, I, I discussed the issues that we encounter with gout. I presented gout presents uh, manifest. Uh, observations in a cohort of 50 Filipinos with young onset gout. And um, I discussed the clinical implications of these uh, observations. And uh, I hope I have contributed to making these issues clearer for us. Like this mirror, we're able to see better. So I hope uh, the lecture has contributed to a better understanding and a better planning of how we manage our patients with gout. Thank you very much for listening. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Salido, for that very scholarly data-driven lecture. Uh, we have a lot of students in the room and I'd like to use one of the terms that they have no, whenever they have a good lecture, that it was a very high yield lecture. For the clinicians as well, this is a good example on how we can aggregate clinic data no, for the purpose of um, 
being able to form better conclusions okay, about a specific condition. Before we move on to the questions and comments, I'd like to call on the, the Section Chief for Rheumatology at the Makati Medical Center, also our faculty member, a clinical asso associate professor in the Division of Rheumatology Department of Medicine here in UPPGH, Dr. Paolo Lorenzo for his reaction. Thank you very much, uh, Hazel. Um, uh, congratulations, uh, Professor Evelyn Salido for that excellent and informative and exhaustive talk on uh, young onset gout and uh, beyond that, uh, gout in general. Um, truly appreciate it. Um, I just want to share uh, some of the important uh, points that, that I picked up from your lecture. Um, which uh, I just like to highlight. Um, the first is the increasing prevalence of gout in the Asia Pacific. You had some countries, uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong, um, that had doubled their prevalence of gout. And uh, in the Philippines, although your data was, it's, it's 2003, um, it's still the most common uh, cause of inflammatory arthritis. And I am very curious to see how that has changed uh, over the last almost 20 years, um, knowing that our culture has changed significantly, our lifestyle, our habits, probably staying home because of this pandemic has changed our dietary habits um, so, and our lifestyle. So it would be, I'd really be interested to see that if it has actually gone up or gone down. I also uh, found very significant that treatment uh, as you mentioned, is not optimized. And in the Philippine uh, study you quoted, only 37% achieve a, a, your target serum uric acid level. That is a dismal uh, result. So that means 60% of our patients who we prescribe urate lowering treatment actually don't meet the goal or the grade. And that puts them at high risk of developing all the things we're trying to avoid um, in the treatment of gout. Um, I'm always reminded that the acute gout arthritis is just the, uh, as you said, the, the top of the, that's that, the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg. And there's just so much more that should be done other than that acute gout attack. Um, so there's a lot of work. We just have to figure out how can we be successful in the uh, adherence, in the uh, achievement of our targets. I think it not only is uh, the patient, it's actually the physician who is supposed to be responsible for informing the patient uh, the vital facts about this disease and not just see them in the clinic for 10 minutes, I gout yan, and then give them medicine and bye-bye, see you. It, it won't work. It really won't work. And then we go to the younger age group. Um, so we're talking about 20, 30, and some even 40 years old. Um, these are the people, if, if the prevalence is true, will be is proven to be going up with this age group, that means these people have a longer duration of their disease. Longer duration, what does that mean? Earlier disability, earlier tofus deposit, deposition, and so I'm always thinking in our rheumatologic conditions, there's really a trend of identifying diseases even before the onset of clinical symptoms. Now for hyperuricemia, we're always taught, no, you do not treat hyperuricemia. It, it's not, there's, there's no indication for it, except let's say if you have other um, associated conditions. But maybe in our, maybe in a tertiary care center, wherein we see um, hyperuricemic patients, asymptomatic, and we have the luxury of a ultrasound, um, which is already done bedside, musculoskeletal ultrasound, and we pick up the double contour sign, which uh, you have uh, mentioned. Maybe we're already indicated, because there's deposition of uric acid, and we already are indicated to start treatment uh, of the hyperuricemia in these asymptomatic people. 
Next, uh, with uh, also the young onset uh, group, um, you mentioned obesity, um, coronary artery disease, maybe hypertension, dyslipidemia, um, metabolic syndrome. These are all the things that are actually uh, red flags to us that maybe we should also look into the uh, uric acid part of this patient and not just treat uh, the obesity, the hypertension, or the dyslipidemia uh, with concern that eventually these people, um, I think you said 10%, can easily develop, um, can go into gout and all the complications of it. Next is the family history. It seems to be very significant. Uh, in your data, 50% of uh, patients um, uh, have a fam of gout patients have a family history, and then very very exciting news. You also mentioned that uh, in certain populations there is a defect in a certain gene which is responsible for urate transport in the kidney. So what does this all mean to us? It, it gives us a, a we're parang, we're honing in on the the root cause of why hyperuricemia is uh, seen in all these populations. And if we can get an idea, uh, maybe in the future, there'll be something about genetic therapy. Who knows? And altering, altering these, uh, these uh, genes that have been, um, that are responsible for hyperuricemia. Um, so I just like to mention the gene ABCG2. So that's something that uh, we, we should now all memorize and keep in our minds and never forget um, that we have that. So uh, in our young onset gout patients, I guess we now are able to identify the risks. Who are the high risk population of getting gout? So you're obese, you have a family history, you have metabolic syndrome, um, uh, and these already are high risk groups. And then you might want to do, okay, I will do a musculoskeletal ultrasound on the knee of these patients because they are in the high risk group. And if I see um, the double contour sign and they're hyperuricemic, I will probably start treatment already of these patients. Um, congratulations on your clinical study. That's great. Uh, um, everything that you mentioned is just uh, a very important information to us. I'm glad that the, although you were uh, disappointed that the time to diagnosis was 4.2 years, uh, the fact that it's better than seven years means that we must be doing something right. And maybe with this new, uh, new generation, 4.2 years will become uh, less than six months and we're good. Um, uh, the high uric acid level of uh, 10.5 in your cohort uh, is really something that we should really work on. Um, oh, and, and also the GFR, we should pay attention a lot more to, to the GFR and the kidney functions of these patients because a few of them uh, actually had low GFRs. So I think that's, my, that's the end of my uh, reaction. Um, you did a very nice talk on how to treat um, uh, gout, and there's really a lot to discuss. But I think uh, I'd like to congratulate you for an excellent talk. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lorenzo, for that very impassioned reaction. Um, for our colleagues here in the group, uh, Dr. Salido and Dr. Lorenzo have been some of the primary advocates for gout in the Philippines. And you could see there um, how it is no, really for us clinicians wanting to improve outcomes for these patients, especially because we do know that in a lot of cases, pwedeng may, meron tayong gawin. So I'm glad the younger, our younger colleagues are here because as Dr. Lorenzo said, this is also a call to arms we need to be able to identify these patients even if they don't present typically. We need to be able to identify them correctly and efficiently treat them so that we do not go into the dire outcomes. So thank you, Dr. Lorenzo. We have a couple of um, comments uh, in the chat box. Um, and uh, from uh, Dr. Pacheco, she, she's very interested in the role of hyperuricemia in metabolic syndrome. 
and how obesity and uh, dyslipidemia has paralleled the in, uh, the rates of or uh, has paralleled uh, gout among our younger population. Dr. Salido, would you like to share your comment on that? Uh, yes, that was uh, nicely shown by the study of DeMarco uh, in, in their uh, cohort of more than uh, 15,000 patients. Uh, these, are, these were young people followed up from age 18, uh, various places in the US. And they found that the presence of obesity at age 21 years old um, makes the onset yeah. of gout earlier by about 11 years. So, um, and uh, they also, well, I, I have to look at their, the prevalence of uh, the rest of the components of metabolic syndrome in that population. Mm -hmm. uh, but glaringly, uh, there is a large effect of obesity on the age of onset of, of gout among people who are predisposed to it. So I think we really need to have a more robust conversation with other, our colleagues who work with patients with metabolic syndrome about this. One of the things that really bothered me, and it, came, it did come out in the Q&A, and Dr. Lorenzo brought it up, is the critical level of asymptomatic hyperuricemia that requires treatment. No? Uh, Dr. Lorenzo was proposing that in a tertiary care center, we don't look for just symptoms, but we look for ultrasound um, evidence of uh, micro deposition and make that also uh, one of the reasons to treat. But it really bothered me that at 9%, you have a 25% chance, at uh, 9 milligrams per deciliter, you have a 25% chance of developing gout in like a decade. So should we really uh, not treat asymptomatic hyperuricemia? Um, maybe in the in the near future we can make more use of our imaging modalities like ultrasound in making that decision. Uh, that is exactly the proposal of Dr. Dalbeth. Now, if you if you Google gout and put there Dalbeth, you will see a lot of studies. Uh, she's really an expert on gout, and her proposal is. Uh, because of this uh, information showing that imaging tests like the ultrasound can already see the deposits, then we can make that uh, a decision, a basis for making a decision uh, on starting ULT among patients who are hyperuricemic. Yeah, and this is even for patients whose baseline uric acid is below nine milligrams per cent, correct? Okay. Yes. Okay, so uh, that's a good thing to remember for our trainees. Uh, Dr. Torres, Sandra Torres, uh, would like to ask if we have any effective educational programs that are in place, because I think she wants to do something about it. No, If we're only successful in a dismal third, that's Dr. Lorenzo's characterization of patients, should we be doing something more? Uh, yes, there are. There are um, various educational strategies that have been studied. So I have looked at uh, several publications on nurse-led or pharmacist-led uh, educational uh, or clinics, no? wherein they, they have a dedicated nurse who has been trained on how to educate gout patients and they hold hand, they hold the hand of the patient with gout, no? Sometimes it's a pharmacist who is given that job, but uh, this is an extra clinic where they go to. Uh, it's something that we need to study in the Philippines, much like the diabetes education clinic. And uh, so to do that, we must really understand our patients with gout more, yeah. no? Because we might be setting up these clinics and then they will not want to go there because uh, they are run by nurses and pharmacists. Who are they? So 
it's something to think about. But in other countries like in the UK, uh, Professor Michael Doherty, uh, another very prominent gout expert, has successfully uh, introduced nurse-led um, educational clinics. Mm -hmm. And they have uh, shown uh, an increase of uh, adherence to double. So uh, if I remember my figures correctly, uh, their baseline adherence is also around 30%, much like our figure. And they were, they were able to double it to more than 60%. Still not perfect, but uh, that is uh, a large improvement. Yes. So very interesting uh, interventions that we can probably design later. Okay, uh, we have a couple more questions. Uh, Dr. Pinsurga says, very excellent deposition. Um, did you look into the geographical distribution in the data? Uh, in the 50 patients? Yeah, maybe in the 50 ah, patients in okay. your data. Yes, uh, well, many of them are from the south. Um, south meaning Cavite, uh, Muntinlupa, Alabang. Uh, uh, some of them, um, so mostly, mostly from the south. Uh, it would be interesting to do a nationwide yeah. uh, data collection. Now we have rheumatologists from all over the Philippines, so if uh, you can contribute your data, I would be happy to compile and we can, we can see if there is any, any effect of geography on that. Okay. Dr. Nadora would like to ask if alcoholism is a significant uh, contributor to your cohort of patients. Uh, in one of the studies uh, I presented uh, among young onset gout in other countries, I just don't remember which one, uh, but I think it was either the one in France or in China. They mentioned alcohol as an important uh, notable trigger uh, in their population of young onset gout. And... Uh, well, I was quite surprised because 50% of the patients I had uh, had had alcohol intake and 30% uh, of them had weekly uh, intake. So that is quite significant. So it's another area of intervention that can possibly uh, be addressed, although it's difficult also to address that. Yes. Uh, but let me mention that I had one patient who was able to really lose weight. Uh, he was 95 kilos when he first came to the clinic. And over two years, he was able to lose 20 kilos. And his uric acid is always four, at most five milligrams. And we have been able to reduce the dose of his medication. So that is anecdotal experience uh, regarding the effect of weight loss. That's also good for Dr. Pacheco to hear. Successful outcomes in weight management. Um, one of our residents would like to uh, follow on on Dr. Lorenzo's comments that if we are to do imaging ultrasound to guide us in using ULTs in asymptomatic patients, how should they go about it? What particular imaging studies in view should be done? Well, uh, what I've showed you were uh, ultrasound and looking for the double contour sign. Although I must say that the double contour sign is uh, not only seen in gout, no. So, um, but also dual energy CT. Uh, I, I'm guessing that they are not yet widely recommended is that the cost is there and the technology is still being studied because uh, there are other disease conditions which can in fact also present with a double contour sign, although it, it has been more uh, widely associated with uh, deposition of monosodium urine. Yeah. So maybe a patient who has the characteristic background history, family history. Yes, history. family history um, and uh, with a typical uh, past arthritis. Yes. Uh, 
recurring ankle pains. Okay. So, um, from Dr. Di Makali, would you recommend chronic ULT intake for patients who are non-hypertensive, non-obese, but have CKD? Even if they don't have a symptom, if they don't have symptomatic gouty arthritis, and would you propose a different target uric acid level for, for patients with CKD? This goes into the origin issue. Um, I, I remember having encountered one or two studies showing that among patients with CKD who are hyperuricemic but do not have gout, they have in fact shown. Uh, delay in progression of um, CKD deterioration. So yes, I would recommend that hyperuricemia in CKD be controlled even if they don't have gout. The observation is that it's more difficult to control the hyperuricemia among CKD patients. So you might uh, need to, to titrate your dose uh, of course, this will be among those who are not yet undergoing dialysis because dialysis will also get rid of some of your urates. Um, but yes, uh, as to the target, it's still uh, six milligrams per deciliter, I believe, for these patients. Can I add on to that? Yeah, so um, we, as Evelyn knows, we reviewed all the guidelines from the different uh, our regions of the world, including the Asia Pacific. And the most, the latest Japan guideline for the management of gout, uh, that is their recommendation. They're the only ones who already have uh, included treatment of uh, CKD or uh, kidney disease in asymptomatic uh, hyperuricemic patients. Uh, is there a threshold that they establish for that, Dr. Lorenzo? Um, they didn't. The, for, for the Japan uh, guidelines, as long as it was actually above 7, seven milligram percent, the, the upper, if it was all above that, um, they already uh, consider that as hyperuricemic and the presumption is you treat. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm sure it's good information for the clinicians in the room. We have one final question. We, are we going to have an updated local CPG on gout soon? These are the people to ask Dr. Salida, Dr. Lorenzo. Do, do I answer that? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, it, <laughs> It, you know, we, we should no. It's it's overdue. The 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 first CPG was in two thousand and seven, uh, from the Philippines. So we're now twenty twenty. Um, give us a uh, a year maximum two years, maybe twenty twenty one, uh, or tw early part of twenty twenty two, um, that we're going to uh, come up with one. Okay. Thank you. Yes, in fact, there's a meeting for that next week. So I'm, glued, I'm sure our younger colleagues are happy to hear that. So uh, we're 15 minutes over time, but I know this is a morning well, an hour and 15 minutes well spent. I learned a lot. I'm certain that a lot of you learned a lot as well. We talked about young onset gout and how the presentation may differ from our classic understanding of gout. For clinicians in the room, Please pay attention to our uh, patients who may have recurrent ankle, ankle pains, especially if they have a characteristic family history or there's obesity or underlying metabolic syndrome. That uh, the typical cases that you are described in the book may not represent all of our gout patients. And it's important to identify also these younger patients because as Dr. Lorenzo said, their journey as far as outcome bad outcomes and complications are even longer than our usual patients. Um, this morning has already also opened their eyes into the need to be able to manage our patients better, get to our outcomes maybe faster and more efficiently so that we, can, we will be able to prevent complications. We talked about um, thresholds in treatment of asymptomatic hyperuricemia and how this may, our understanding or increasing understanding of the origin of gout 
will change, will likely change in the next coming years. Dr. Salido also identified for us genetic uh, back, uh, basis for hyperuricemia among our patients, and we look forward to the data that we will be generating in the Philippines as far as this is concerned. I would have to say that was one lecture that was truly worthy of a professorial chair. We'd like to thank the University of the Philippines Diamond Jubilee, um, Jubilee for the professorial chair granted to Dr. Salido that has allowed her to come up with this paper. Again, thank you very much for everybody's attention and a big congratulations to Dr. Salido for a very scholarly discourse this morning. Have a good rest of the day, everyone. Galing, ma'am. Sobrang but, high yield. Thank you. Thank you. And wow, super. Super, super. Thank you. Hopefully, madagdagan pa yung 50. Kinulang na ako ng oras. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe, ma'am, we can also share our data na for our other patients as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Oh. Oh, baka may president pa na naghahanap ng paper dyan. Nandito lang kami. <laughs> JC and uh, Anton, thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Congratulations po. Thank you. Sana may natutunan kayo doon. Parang okay. Uh, I will just ask, I, I will just unmute certain people just in case I'll perform put them as panelists just in case they want to say or to greet you, ma'am. I'll un put panelists to Dr. Nadora, Dr. Ma'am Lexi. Baka may gusto lang silang sabihin. No, I'm here, but congratulations lang, Evelyn. Thanks. But we should take this offline. We're in, uh, I think we should be able to do more considering your background statistics. Uh, seriously sit down with Paolo and the rest of the SIG group and get the whole PRA involved because your statistics are alarming. Um, I think the intervention when we see our patients are already too late. So I'm always for the prevention and that's just why remember how I would just, you know, heart actually bark on having educational programs. So there's uh, we really need a lot of hand-holding, yeah. Um, I think it's the only way to move forward. So I'm still looking for innovative ways of uh, doing this without, with less cost. As of course, the burden of illness is there, but I, I, among the other diseases, they're always going to say this is technically not immediately life-threatening. So that, that's my issue. Yes. Congratulations. Really good. But give us copies of the lecture. Huh? I mean, <laughs> recording man lang so we can do <laughs> Ilalagay na lang natin yung record sa ano? So YouTube. <laughs> yes, yes, agree, agree. Yeah. But, and then seriously, Evelyn and Paolo, I think, and Hazel, sit down. I mean, um, we, we can't, I, I, you know, we'll have to really seriously <clears throat> sit down and find, find out ways on, on how to move forward. Because data is one thing, but at the end, <laughs> yung babagsak na dito, so what did we do about it? Yeah. You know, yeah. Like, agree. Evelyn, I like your idea of doing FGDs because those foreign data, I mean, foreign in, um, suggestions may not necessarily directly work. I love yep. what you said about let's sit down with our patients, ask them why. I mean, we have to get insights, the real insights as to why there's poor adherence, why there's, you know, why they still, <laughs> and you know, they made this concept about food. It's only 10%, as you said, overproduction is 10%. So uh, what aggressive measures should we do as early on as when somebody comes in with asymptomatic hyperuricemia with the risk factors of metabolic syndrome or immediately ask, do they have a family history? Baka yung parang gawa tayong algorithm. <laughs> what question should we ask if uh, they answer yes to X number of questions, this is what you should do. And it's not X-ray, it's musculoskeletal ultrasound. That's what... Uh, uh, Paolo mentioned, uh, baka we can do something like that. An informal kind of algorithm, then test it out, test it out. And, and, and. Thank you. Thanks, Lexi. Thank you. Thank you, Lexi. Picture naman tayo po. <laughs> Nandiyo po ba si Dr. John? Uh, uh, Nandiyo ka pa dyan? 
baka nag-off. Baka wala na. Kasi baka nag- ay, nag-clinic na. Hindi, UP Manila Science and Technology Week din kasi. Oo nga, sabay-sabay. Sabay-sabay. Oo. Oo. So, tayong tatlo na. Um, tayong like, tatlo si na lang. Oo. So, wala kasi si Mom Pen early eh. Hindi ko na siya na Mm-mm. analyst. Ayan. So. Picture tayo, Lex. <laughs> Wala na rin. <laughs> Wala na rin yan. <laughs> okay, how do I do this? Um, Gallery view. Pa. I, oh yeah. my God. Okay. You can take a picture. Magsasalamin na lang ako. Ah, sige, sige. We're recording. Baka pwede nang stop yung recording, Anton? Okay po, ma'am, sir. 